So uh, as we transition to the videos and resistance part of uh, the show, I I know that it, just a couple of days ago, one of the um, biggest uh, casualty mass casualty events uh, for the Israeli army happened um, in Al Mawasi, but um, the New York Times kind of framed what the soldiers were doing uh, when they were um, uh, uh, attacked um, as just kind of like a normal uh, Israeli army operation. Um, they referenced something uh, that they called the buffer zone. Um, let's start with that. Let's start with what the soldiers were doing in Al Mawasi and uh, uh, sorry, in Megazi, not Mawasi, in Megazi camp, um, and 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 what what happened? Hi guys, yeah. So Monday, four p.m. Um, local time, um, social media started to uh, come alive with Israeli um, social media accounts talking about a disaster that happened in the Gaza Strip. Um, as it turned out, um, they had to admit to at least 21 deaths so far um, in an operation where their forces were laying mines um, to blow up, uh, basically to blow up neighborhood blocks, um, rather than using airstrikes, which are expensive and, uh, you know, resource intensive with the, the cost of the fighter jets and the bombs that are given to them for basically free by the Americans. Um, the Israelis have been carrying out this operation on the ground where they literally uh, wire up the buildings um, and explode them. And so the Israeli uh, Defense Forces spokesperson said that this was one of those operations, 600 meters um, across the border from an Israeli uh, settlement in the south. And the nature of the attack was that the uh, Palestinian Qassam Brigade's fighter, it appears to be uh, an individual fighter, fired a uh, Yassin at this force that was laying these mines um, and blew up the house that they were in. And we've got a little bit of visuals here so people can understand what we're talking about, about these mines, because they've started to come out a little bit in the news over the last couple of weeks because of this uh, footage, in particular this footage. This is Isra University, which is in um, in in Gaza City, um, and the Israelis uh, are showing this from their drone uh, camera footage. This is um, uh, what they do. This is what the mines do. They basically vaporize these buildings. Um, this is hundreds of mines um, to, to, to carry out an operation like that. And this is, again, a social media account showing um, these anti-tank mines and um, Israeli soldiers have been talking about it, about how they're basically donkeys um, carting these uh, anti-tank mines all over Gaza to blow um, to blow things up, to blow up entire city blocks. If we look at this next one, um, we can see what they're doing. And the operation in Al Mughazi, they were trying to uh, blow up 10 um, 10 buildings. And we've seen if people on people have probably seen from the Israeli TikTok army that the that they've been the Israeli army has been releasing videos like this, where they're actually in the videos, I chose not to show them, I think people can go find them if they want. Um, but acting like idiots, um, you know, mocking what's happening, doing uh, ridiculous dances, um, and then pressing the trigger um, to detonate these entire blocks with these massive explosions. Um, we saw a TikTok video of them going, of Israeli soldiers going through a Palestinian house and taking the clock off the wall and hanging a mine on it, taking family pictures and smashing them and hanging mines on them. So this has been something that the Israelis have really uh, dug deep into in their, in their TikTok uh, war. Um, which is always juxtaposed really starkly with the resistance videos that we show and that the Qassam brigades and Palestinian resistance release all the time. Um, but yeah, so this operation was them laying these mines, being in the process of laying these mines um, and getting struck by the Palestinian resistance. And what these mines are, what they're doing, although Isra University was just an example of them destroying the seven universities in the Gaza Strip as part of a systematic campaign, which is basically all the military is doing, destroying, but the only systematic thing that's happening is the attack of hospitals and schools, which has been 
happening since the beginning. Um, and the Isra University uh, administration said that that actually was used as a base um, by the Israelis before it was blown up. Um, and so there's no um, pretext of this being um, anything other than destruction. But let's just look at some of these maps because what Israel is attempting to do here um, is establish uh, what they call a buffer zone. Um, and essentially, this is a, an attempt, and Israel has done this just to say all along, when I lived in Gaza uh, in the Second Intifada, basically all of what Israel was doing was creating buffer zones, creating them around the settlements, creating them around the border areas. Um, and essentially, the goal is to, um, to, to push the population back away from the settlements that are in that envelope that we've been talking about, that we talked about on the show uh, many times, that that was the target of October 7th. It's also, of course, the villages where the Palestinians who live in Gaza, the refugees um, who came from those villages. Um, but this is an attempt that Israel has done. They do it in the north as well, of course, with Hezbollah trying to push them off the border. Um, but when you're talking about the Gaza Strip, um, you're talking about a place that's six kilometers wide. Um, and so this attempt to set up um, the buffer zone, um, you can see it in the next couple images. Let's do the before and after here tomorrow. You can see um, so this is the this this is the area in Gaza before this is uh, early in the war, uh, photographed by um, the Israeli Defense Forces. And if you look in this next photo, you can see what they're what they're doing. They're just erasing um, population centers and moving them back from the border by carrying out these operations where they they spend time and resources. Um, to stay in position and wire up the buildings. These are not airstrikes that happen in the snap of a finger. These are days-long operations to rig up uh, explosives in these buildings. And, and really, when you just look at that before and after, um, I mean, it looks like an eraser was used. Um, and, and so the footage of Isra University um, was something that actually made the news in part because the Associated Press's Matt Lee questioned a uh, State Department spokesperson about this um, and asked about it. And, and the Israelis were kind of, the, I mean, the spokesperson was caught off guard by it, but um, the Israelis are caught off guard by it because they're they're doing this for, for weeks uh, on end and don't get any coverage. And then all of a sudden, uh, the State Department is asking them questions about why they blew up this, uh, why they blew up the university. Um, and so they tell, of course, just patent lies about the university um, and say that they're looking into it, which is, of course, something we've talked about uh, on this show since uh, the show began, um, the way that Israel uh, d carries out these kind of investigations when they're, they're as if they're surprised by what happened. Although the videos that we showed are Israeli army drone footage. Um, so they're very well aware of what's happening. And in the, in the Western media, this was framed yesterday as a surprise to Blinken that, that Israel was creating a buffer zone, even though Israel has said that that's what they're doing. And they've talked about this buffer zone as part of the third stage uh, of this war that's happening right now, where they are uh, taking some of the reserve forces and putting them back into their flagging economy. Um, and they're and they're establishing a buffer zone. They're bulldozing uh, a buffer zone, and they're doing that in part um, by by laying these mines. So now let, let's watch the Qassam operation. So Qassam describes the operation um, exactly the same way as the Israelis that they that their fighters. Um, this is footage now we're showing here of the of a, of a building. Uh, a Qassam fighter firing through the undergrowth, presumably using an attack tunnel, and then uh, moving around the corner to hit a tank, which we know the Israelis um, admitted to two of the uh, tank crew were killed in that operation. Um, and this, so this, uh, this is the, again, the Qassam brigades who were told uh, by the Israelis who need to say that they're destroyed um, before the Israelis can withdraw. Um, we're seeing Qassam respond within hours to this story uh, that was came that came originally through social media, um, because of course the Israelis have a censor on all this information, and so there's not normal society reporting uh, on what's going on. It's all covered by a censor. But because of the 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 scale of this attack, 21 dead, 
at least that's how, that's the number that they've admitted that they they had to confront um, this attack uh, head on and, and explain it because their populations were saying what's going on because people are worried about their families who are the soldiers and whatnot. So the IDF, unlike other times when they can just uh, ignore it or lie about it, um, they had to confront uh, this operation and explain what happens. And then Cassandra Brigades release within 12 hours a video of what um, of the operation that they say is connected to uh, to what happened in Al Mughazi. Um, again, this is carried out by the Central uh, Camps um, uh, Brigade of the Qassam Brigades, who we talked about on the last show, saluting their uh, their leaders, and we've talked about them uh, for a number of shows because this middle camps resistance has been fierce for this war for the Israelis. And so they're not actually this operation as the Israelis were saying was what they call it a defensive operation because they're setting up, uh, a buffer zone and the buffer zone is set up so that Israelis will come back and live in the South. And that's what the IDF spokesperson said. So they're carrying out this operation so that the uh, Gaza envelope villages, uh, settlements, um, kibbutz, um, people will come home because as we know, there's hundreds of thousands of Israelis um, who are out of their houses, both in the North and in the south and uh, a lot of israel's exit plan for this war has to somehow include um, pictures of people going back to the south um, and and setting up again um, otherwise the the war is clearly a, a failure for the israelis um, even by their own standards with their own people um, and so this operation again shows that Qassam has clear command and control um, presuming that this attack used an attack tunnel um, it shows that the um, the resistance can reach the Israelis anywhere they are, which is, of course, the truth in Palestine anywhere, anywhere the Israeli army is in all of Palestine, there's resistance in whatever form people can pull together in that spot. In this spot, we're seeing um, a, a trained force, a disciplined force. Um, carrying out operations consistently. Again, everything that I'm going to show on this show today has been from the last seven days since you last saw us. We're not cherry picking these reports. These are, if, if anything, I have to cull through all the videos to find, uh, you know, to shorten them down to get them in because there's so many operations by this resistance force um, that doesn't show any signs of being uh, degraded in the way that Israel needs to say is happening. They count every, the Israelis hide their casualties and count every single male that's killed in the Gaza Strip as a Qassam Brigade's elite force fighter, um, this kind of absurdity when really they're killing, uh, you know, mostly women and children and, and non-involved people um, to the tune of, of 100,000 casualties right now. And that those are just the, the wounded and, and, and killed already that we know. The operation in Khan Yunus is a devastating war crime happening around uh, shelters and hospitals. Um, it's a brutal operation. And then Israel is able to say in their media um, that this kind of uh, buffer zone uh, operation is a defensive operation when they have 100,000 forces inside the Gaza uh, Strip fighting, dropping bombs, uh, 35,000 plus airstrikes. Um, so you get a sense both from that attack, uh, the ability for the Qassam Brigades to respond um, to the media discussions. As soon as the Israelis, um, they, they announced it the next morning, Tuesday morning, uh, local time. And as soon as they announced it, the Qassam Brigades, like literally within two minutes of the IDF acknowledging it, the Qassam Brigades released a field report with a visual of 21 uh, triangles. Um, so we're seeing them interact um, immediately. We're, we're not seeing some kind of delayed response that takes days. They're not piecing together some uh, footage to try to show that it was an operation. That, that, that operation looked like exactly what the Israelis described. Um, and so I don't think we need why to Why do stay. you think the Israelis, uh, John, uh, sorry to interrupt you, why do you think the Israelis came out and said what happened? I mean... In the past, they have said, they've claimed that their soldiers were killed in friendly fire incidents, which in a certain sense is, I mean, that's very embarrassing if you're shooting or killing a lot of your own people, but it's less embarrassing in a way than the resistance killed all these people. What You know, choose your poison. 
Why didn't they try to present this as an engineering accident? I guess. Is like, it because they know be killed by an enemy fighter who's courageous and skilled than to say that you you blew up your your comrade because you were making a TikTok video? I mean, it's not clear to me what the Israelis are thinking by this. Um, I mean, one of the tenets uh, of war is to respect your opponent, and why not say that your um, that your your people are being killed by highly trained, skilled fighters who you know who are showing extraordinary courage. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me why they want to say that they blew each other up by being scared and opening fire on anybody, which we know the Israelis do because we know from their killing their own people that having a white flag, no shirt on. I mean, these these guys that were killed um, in Shijaiya by the Israelis that were trying to come out um, from captivity and go to their own people to save them. Um, they knew to not wear T-shirts so that the Israelis wouldn't shoot them for saying they were suicide bombers. Um, and so they came out of uh, with no shirts on, with their hands up, with white flags, writing SOS on the wall. And the Israelis are so scared um, that they still kill those people. So it, it's not clear to me why friendly fire is, is a good way. I think that uh, the answer to the question why this time that they admitted it is because the scale of the attack um, it came out, um, first of all, it lit up the entire skyline with clouds from the destruction. Um, but then there, the, the, the rescue effort was such that the Israelis used civilian ambulances um, and fire trucks. Um, and I think at some point, the lie you can't lie um, on, on a large scale like this in a society, I mean, in any society, but in a society where people are actually participating. So people start talking, they, they get text messages from their family, and they're describing this disaster in the, in the South. Yeah. And so I think the Israelis had to come out and say what happened. Um, at first, it seemed like they were only going to admit to 10 deaths. Um, then they added, um, they're up to 21. And presumably, it's more than that, because it doesn't sound like there was, it sounds like the, the, the mines destroyed at least three buildings. Um, and drop them on top of their fighters. So I think in, in some in some cases like this, they just can't lie. Um, and they when, also didn't announce, John, if I'm correct, or um, correct me if I'm wrong, they didn't say any number of injuries. They only announced the number no. of deaths. Uh, based on, you know, typical military rules of thumb, there are probably at least three injured, if not more, for every one killed right unless you vaporize them with hundreds of anti-tank mines like I, I don't know if there's they couldn't get the rubble i mean the, the israeli example gives you a sense of what the palestinians are living through they couldn't find the people in the rubble um even with all of their um you know civil defense that's allowed to exist to dig people out of the rubble that's not allowed for palestinians um and so i think yeah there, it's possible that there's a, a lot more in that incident and um i think the way the way that israel covers up their casualties in part is because they're able to sort of say to each family like we're not saying that uh, israel's lying to all these families and telling them that their kids are in goa or something like that um it's just that they're able to um you know leak out the the deaths one by one they ask people not to have big um uh, big funerals. They concentrate the funerals. We saw today um, the funeral um, become part of sort of like a national event for the Israelis and some of the uh, Israeli uh, senior officials that came to it were attacked by um, by the family members who are starting to say in Israel that people are dying um, for a war that they're not winning. And they're showing footage, the footage that comes home um, is showing their army being uh, committing war crimes and generally being cowardly and destructive. And I, I'm not sure that in the end, I mean, the Israelis clearly believe that these kind of descriptions um, are what their population wants. Like um, Gallant said the other, like in response to this, he said, the plumes of smoke from the tanks, artillery and air force planes will continue to cover the skies of the Gaza Strip until we achieve our goals. So it's like that they, they do believe that their population wants to see Gaza um, destroyed. But at some point, um, this fighting is going to be too much for them to bear. And I think we're starting to see those cracks uh, in Israeli society and these kind of um, large scale things. It's very hard to cover it up in Israel when um, people participated, you know, in the in the rescue operation of these soldiers. 
um, for 12 hours. Um, and I, these I just, were reservists, right? And they wiped out a, 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 an entire uh, unit of reservists aged 22 to 40 years old. Because, because the reservists are the ones who, um, from, from some of the things I've read, they generally try to keep the reservists out of the front line, out of combat. You know, the reservists are doing the engineering, they're doing the logistics, they're doing the backup work, but they're not the first people sent to do the frontline fighting because these are civilians who are, you know, going for however many weekends a year they have to go for their reserve training. But also because the societal cost, you know, you haven't, if you're a career soldier, you've signed up for that. It's kind of the deal that you may be sent in somewhere where you're going to die. If you're a reservist, that's not necessarily what you're trying to do. So my point here is that the impact of these being reservists on the society is probably magnified uh, as compared to if they were, you know, uh, professional uh, frontline combat units. Yeah, I mean, they want it both ways because they brag about these reservists. Remember, we talked for a couple shows at the beginning about how they bragged about how they called up all these reservists and everybody's ready to fight in Israeli society. And then, um, yeah, the the economy has has tanked based on the fact that the, the entire country is more or less shut down. The entire north, the entire south um, is not operating. And so part of Israel's war aims had to be to release some of the reservists to show that they were moving some of these people out. Um, but, um, but yeah, the, the operation, they called it a defensive operation because they're working, um, in the buffer zone. Um, but, um, let, let's, let's move to the videos cause we'll show, I'm going to show you here, um, the way that the Palestinians are able to reach the buffer zone. There's no spot that you can put reservists that puts them somehow out of the line of fire. Um, because if we go through these, uh, videos here, let's, um, let's tee those up tomorrow. Um, this is uh, this is an attack tunnel. We're watching right now Palestinians climbing a ladder um, it, it, through a hole in the ground, um, coming out through into the buffer zone and targeting an Israeli uh, vehicle here. We see three fighters come out, a cameraman who's separate, and then we see uh, the Palestinian uh, guerrilla, the uh, Qassam Brigade's fighter, firing his Yassin um, from the buffer zone. Um, so the, the tunnel network that the Israelis have now said is 50% larger than they believed it was, um, uh, that, the, the, so they now believe that there's more than 700 kilometers of these tunnels. These tunnels, uh, involve, uh, are, go all through this buffer zone and they, and we know that they go into Israel, uh, as well, because we know that those attack tunnels were used in 2014 in the operation uh, to come out. And see here, we're seeing in this footage right here, that those are civilian ambulances um, taking part in these operations on the border. Um, and clearly we're seeing a helicopter here. This is just an aside, but it, it's pretty clear that the Palestinian resistance is not targeting um, the medevac helicopters, which is an interesting uh, development because these helicopters are have carried out more than 1400 medevacs that's what israel's admitted to um, in this operation so that that if we can loop it around again tomorrow so the the video we can see him climbing up a ladder through a hole in the ground because they're able to dig out from um dig the tunnel network to make an attack tunnel they can make the 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 spot where they exit the tunnel to fight um, in any of these places. So the longer the Israelis are in this buffer zone, um, the more these kind of attacks um, can happen. And after this, tomorrow, if we could just show the still photo, because it, uh, this shot is just, uh, we see the Yassin and we talk about it and we often see it from helmet camera uh, footage, but there's, there's a good shot of what it looks like, the Gaza made uh, Yassin RPG uh, with their uh, 105 millimeter dual charged uh, explosive. So that's what we've been showing in the videos uh, for the last four months is uh, that weapon. And you can see this fighter coming out of an attack tunnel and setting up on, on a hillside. Um, the, the level of detail of this operation uh, and the courage of this operation, um, you, you couldn't more starkly juxtapose it with a TikTok army smashing some innocent family in Gaza's family photos and then hanging 
uh, and then hanging a mine on the wall and and doing some sort of dance. Um, it, 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 the, the, the combination between the lying about their casualties and what they choose to brag about um, in this war is just, it's really stark. And um, I think that mine operation uh, disaster for the Israelis and a complex, well-executed operation for the Palestinians, which includes, according to uh, the field report by the Qassam Brigades, included um, detonating a minefield as well. So it was a complex attack uh, involving um, uh, planning and, and detail um, that these Israeli forces are now, if, they're, if their goal is to set up in the buffer zone so that you're somehow pushing Palestinians back for one kilometer further from the settlements, uh, these videos show that that clearly uh, isn't going to happen. So that, that, uh, that one we just watched, that was three fighters exiting a tunnel. If we go to the next one tomorrow, number 10, um, again, you can see them climbing out of the ground with a fresh hole dug. So we're watching a, an attack tunnel that didn't exist several weeks ago when Israel's is clearing this area. You can see the fighter climb out of the tunnel, and here we're watching him load up his RPG um, with a helmet cam. Um, and you can see by the way the topsoil is in this area that they dug that tunnel to exit the tunnel to fight. That wasn't a previously existing exit. So the Israelis believe that they're bulldozing, and that's why we've seen so much footage of these D9 bulldozers, the Caterpillar bulldozers, armored bulldozers, is because Israel believes that if they till the top layer of soil, um, that they'll expose these tunnels. And that um, has clearly not been the case because we've shown you for months now um, Palestinians exiting tunnels that clearly show that they've just been dug. Um, and so the capacity for these kind of attacks um, is, is extremely significant. And it's something that the longer the Israelis are in this buffer zone, the more likely these kind of attacks are. And that's got to be clear to anyone in the Israeli army that's laying mines today. Um, I think they'll be a little more circumspect about their TikTok videos today because I think everybody's going to be looking over their shoulder in the buffer zone um, to these kind of operations. And you're seeing here, you're watching footage here of a, of a Palestinian getting within, I mean, it's hard to tell with the zoom there, but a, a couple dozen meters at most away from an armored vehicle who that is a, 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 an engineering troop carrier that in, is looking for tunnels and setting up this buffer zone. Um, and you're seeing fighters um, that know the terrain. So this is east of Barrage. Again, this is in the central camps. These are Palestinians fighting in their own neighborhoods. They know the tunnel network. They have it mapped above and below ground and are able to carry out operations where they use the tunnel network and dig out an exit um, for the attack tunnel. And this kind of uh, local guerrilla, you know, who knows their own terrain, um, these kind of attacks are... Um, they're impossible to stop for the Israelis. Um, and, and these are going to go on uh, as, as long as this war continues, which is why Israel is killing its own prisoners, um, because the exit strategy for Israel in this war isn't clear. It's not clear that they're willing to exchange all for all prisoners, which they could have done, by the way, on the first day. The, the, the attack on October 7th um, didn't require genocide to take place. Um, there could have been uh, solutions to this. And there there's, could be solutions in the North as well that don't involve sparking World War III um, by destroying Lebanon and bringing the American Marines and whatnot into a, a wider uh, war that Helena was talking about at the beginning. Um, there's uh, diplomatic and political ways out of this conflict that exchange prisoners of war for prisoners of war um, uh, uh, and end this, it, and end what, this what's carnage. Pati what's particularly crazy about the Israeli approach, I mean, it's genocide, number one. I mean, that's that's the overarching reality. But the idea of a so-called buffer zone, I mean, they tried that. They tried that in Lebanon for 20 years. They had the so-called uh, South Lebanon security zone, as they called it. And they were just bled and bled and bled. They were attacked all the time and Hezbollah drove them out. And they they left. They, they withdrew like thieves in the night in uh, 
Yeah, they left their May, computers May, plugged in and, and, and just ran down the hill. I, back I, into I the... went I went to South Lebanon in, they withdrew May 25th of the year 2000. I was there, I think it was the end of June or beginning of July, but everything was still fresh. The people there had preserved everything the way it was and they were showing us around. And we went up to uh, hilltop um, outposts that were either Israeli army outposts or outposts of the South Lebanon army, the South Lebanon version of the Palestinian Authority, the traitor uh, militia that uh, Israel set up and which also fled. Most of its members fled to Israel. And their clothes were there. Their boots were there. There were cans of food that were half eaten. I yeah, mean, they, they just ran away. They ran away. They ran away. So they tried that for 20 years in Lebanon. And what it generated was an even stronger Hezbollah. Something that Helena said earlier, Helena Coburn, that really struck me. I remember, I was in college at the time, that it was a big deal at the time. It was a big news story when Israel arrested these hundreds of members of Hamas and other uh, resistance groups and political leaders from Gaza, I think from the West Bank too. In, in, in other words, hundreds of people and just dumped them over the border in Lebanon, which was completely illegal. It was a war crime. Lebanon refused to take them because they said, we are not going to be the dumping ground where Israel can expel Palestinians at will. So these guys were stuck in this border zone, and it was in winter, hundreds of them for, I, I can't remember how long it was, whether it was weeks or months or whatever, but I'd never thought of that until Helena mentioned it as eventually it became a school for yeah. these hundreds of leaders to learn resistance tactics from Hezbollah. So that was Israel supposed to be supposedly collectively punishing and dismantling Hamas. And what they ended up doing was strengthening its relationships with Hezbollah and turning it into an even more effective force. So they never learn. They never uh, say, well, yeah, we tried that. It was a huge mistake. Didn't work out for us. It's always, let's do again and again and again the same thing we've be do been doing. But let's add more baby murder. Let's add more slaughter of, uh, of, of kids. Let's add more humiliation and torture and murder of elders. Let's see if that works. Let's add more atrocities and see if we get better results. Yeah, and these buffer zones are also shoot to kill zones, right? Like uh, when I reported from Gaza in the second intifada, the kids, you had to rely on the kids to tell you exactly where the buffer zone line was uh, because the Israelis, well, we saw it on the Great March of Return as well, um, that the Israelis fire into these buffer zones, their free fire zones and shoot to kill zones where they, the kids, it's the kids walking to school. In Rafa, when I lived in Rafa, they were killing kids walking to school. Um, the, the buffer zones are an extremely violent area for the indigenous population. The idea that it's some kind of defensive zone or it's like some kind of cordon sanitaire or whatever, uh, it's just not the truth. And Marja Zahur is the, the hill that they uh, sent the Hamas uh, leadership to uh, in Lebanon. And yeah, it became a university uh, for them to learn tactics, which uh, Hezbollah had learned previously from the Palestinians. It's been a constant back and forth throughout the, the course of these struggles. So uh, that's an important moment in the history of the armed struggle. Uh, there's no question about that. So uh, I'm glad that she brought that up. That's an important point. Let's 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 do number 11 here, uh, Tamara. This is, uh, this is in Jabalia. Again, an attack tunnel bringing multiple fighters out um, through the morning fog here uh, that you can see in Gaza um, and reaching Israeli armored vehicles. And so there's no buffer zone that's a defensive buffer zone. That's just not, it's just not true. It's not possible with the tunnel network. It's not possible that the fighters are going to relieve, to, to not fight uh, in this zone. So it's even, an, it's an impossible task that the Israelis uh, are, are setting up here. But the task involves erasing thousands of Palestinian uh, homes. Uh, in, in, and as we know from Rafat, uh, 
many generations live in these homes. Um, and so when one home uh, can be home to 40 people, 50 people, and they're destroying hundreds of them uh, in each day um, as part of a systematic policy. So I just wanted to show this one because it's uh, through the morning fog uh, that is a, a benefit to the resistance fighters as well. And in the winter in Gaza, uh, the morning fog uh, is, is a thing. So you can see them again, moving through their own their own territory. These are their own areas in Jabalia. These are where these fighters live. The fighters fight in their in their own communities, um, defending their own communities. And so this is Jabalia in the far north uh, of Gaza. We watched the middle camps uh, area of Gaza, and we know that there is extremely fierce fighting. There, there are in, those Adidas units. pants again. Sorry, John. Yeah, I, I don't know if that that's probably the best endorsement deal Adidas didn't want. <laughs> They should want it. They, uh, yeah, no, the resistance fighters are uh, clearly using comfortable attire uh, to carry out these these operations um, and are very successful in it. So let's, let's. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.